It's election day, but how accurate are the polls? I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. It's election day. We're really excited over here at True North. We're going to have a live election show broadcast to you this entire evening, starting at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. We will be live on Facebook and on YouTube, so you can tune in see everything as it's rolling in. We'll be announcing the uh, writings. We'll be letting you know who's ahead. We'll be giving analysis and opinion and just chock full of really, really entertaining uh, content. So please tune in tonight. As for today, I want to get a little bit deeper into the polls, what they're showing, what the predictions are, and, and what's gonna, how it's going to play out tonight. So to uh, get a little bit deeper into that, I am joined by True North's Hamish Marshall. Hi, Hamish. How are you? Hi, Candice. How are you? Good, good. Excited. I think it's going to be an interesting night. Although I will say that uh, some people are calling this the most boring election in Canadian history. Now, there have been a lot of boring elections in the past, but nothing has really stood out even today on election day. I don't really know what the ballot box question will be. So uh, I, I think that, that the prediction is that that's going to impact voter turnout. Uh, what, what are you seeing in terms of voter turnout and what, what do you think it's going to look like today? Yeah, you know, it's difficult to predict voter turnout at the best of times. Generally speaking, the polls seem to indicate a, a lower enthusiasm to vote, which usually turns into, into, into lower turnout. But we saw a big increase in the advanced polls, 5.6 million people voting in the advanced polls. Probably uh, when it's all said and done, close to a million will have voted by mail. Um, so those are those are huge, huge increases. Now, partly that's due to the pandemic. It's also true over the last 20 years, advanced polls have seen a general increase in turnout as it's become easier and easier to vote. And people just want to get it out of the way and, and over that four day advanced poll period. So it's all balanced. It's hard to say how it all balances out. But I think uh, I think turnout generally looking at it, it's probably going to be a bit down from last time. Uh, but, you know, some people are, are predicting very quite low turnout, millions less people voting. I think that's reasonably unlikely as well. And so what will a lower voter turnout or at least a moderately lower voter turnout mean for the parties? Is it, is it good news for the Tories, good news for the Liberals? What do you what do you think? Well, it, it actually really, really depends who isn't motivated to turn out because these a lower turnout doesn't. Uh, sink all boats evenly to uh to, to destroy a, a metaphor um it's it really if certain parties are more, less or more motivated that could have a big impact and traditionally speaking though conservative parties that are taking power do better in advance in larger turnout that people who are mad come out and vote who typically don't vote so usually what you see is you know uh, when cons when the conservatives come into power, the turnout goes up. Uh, when but when also when Justin Trudeau uh, won in in twenty fifteen, turnout went up because there was people who are non uh, non regular voters who are fired up and say I'm going to vote this time. So generally speaking, a lower turnout is probably not great for the opposition parties. But on the other hand, as we've seen, you know the Liberals, while they might have a slight lead in the polls, it's not enough to make them feel particularly comfortable either. Interesting. And also, given what we know about COVID and the sort of people who are really spooked by it, they tend to be liberal voters or at least more on the left side, uh, progressive side of the political spectrum. So if people aren't voting because they're worried about COVID, I think that would probably also be better news for the Tories. But uh, I, I, I don't know uh, as much. That's, that's more speculation. I, I wanted to uh, point your attention to this uh, McLean's uh, seat projection that was released over the weekend that, uh, according to this, it shows that the Liberals are, are set to win a very narrow victory, uh, losing seats uh, from their count last time. Um, so this has the Liberals uh, po poised to win 148 seats down from 157 in 2019, the Conservatives winning approximately 112 seats down from 121 in 2019. And so that's all because it shows the NDP really surging, nearly doubling um, their seats from 24 up to 42, and the Bloc winning about 35. Uh, is, is, it, is this sort of in line with, with the numbers that you're crunching or what, what do you think of this production here? Yeah, I, I think I think this production is not bad. I think it's I think it's pretty good. And there's a couple of caveats. Uh, number one, we've seen the NDP uh, uh, numbers in the polls soften a little bit over the weekend. So while a lot of polls late last week were showing them at 20, 21, even some I think one of them had about 22 percent. We're now seeing, I think somebody had them at 17 and a half yesterday. So we're now seeing them waft down into the teens a little bit. They're still gonna pick up seats. They got 16% last time. So even if they only got 18 or 19%, they're gonna pick up seats. 
but maybe not quite as many as if they were, you know, at 21. Um, the other thing is that the block at 35, the block won 32 uh, seats last time. Uh, there's a lot of seats they could that are close, but it is worth noting that uh, no pollsters had the block getting more votes than they did last time in, in, in a week. So they're certainly not on track to, uh, to lose a lot of seats, uh, but I could see the block, frankly, netting out about the same, ending up at 32 seats. So I think 35 is about as good as it gets for the block. Uh, and if I if they ended up at 33 or 31, I wouldn't be surprised about that either. And the likely beneficiary of certainly of the block not quite getting 35 is probably two or three more liberal seats. The NDP doesn't do quite as well. It's both liberals and, and conservatives who can who can profit from that. There's a bunch of seats that, can, that the NDP can take off uh, the conservatives, but they're also taking a bunch of seats off the liberals. And so uh, with, with this projection, I mean, I've, I've seen it sort of go both ways. It could be a very narrow liberal victory or a very narrow conservative victory. So let's hone in on that conservative vote. I, I've, I've, I've read, again, just really a mixed bag, but uh, some polls show that um, the conservatives are doing really strong in British Columbia, um, that because of the NDP surge, that there's a lot of three-way races where the conservatives could be the beneficiaries and that uh, Aaron O'Toole is, is, is polling uh, nearly twice as well in Ontario as as uh, Shear was in 2019. So, uh, how how are the conservatives looking? What what is the likelihood of Aaron O'Toole uh, winning the popular vote and winning the most number of seats tonight? Uh, I think the likelihood of both those things is relatively small. Um, he's got a bit better chance of winning the popular vote. Uh, the the, the con general consensus in the polls in 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 Ontario is that the Conservatives are uh, maybe doing a little bit better than last time, uh, but not uh, enough to make a huge difference in terms of seat count. Um, and they and they're also the polls seem to have them doing a little bit better in, in Quebec in terms of votes. Probably won't make any difference at all to the Conservative seat count in Quebec. But on the flip side, doing considerably worse in Alberta and Saskatchewan. That means that winning the popular vote is going to be tricky, although it is mathematically possible. Um, the other big thing that's going to happen, as, I, as we've discussed before, is that the Greens are only running candidates in three quarters of the ridings. So if you look across the country and you look at what the what the polls are saying for the Greens, it, it varies. But let's say on average they're around four percent. If they're if they're pulling four percent, they're probably going to get three percent, and the Liberals are going to be a big beneficiary for that. So I expect the Liberals are going to outperform their polling average by maybe half a point, three quarters of a point, um, which could make a difference in a whole bunch of races. Um, so that's something that has to be considered as well. And then the big X factor is, is the PPC. Well, okay, let's let's jump right into the PPC because we saw a sort of last minute appeal by a lot of people in Team Tory uh, that a vote for Maxine Bernier is basically a vote for Justin Trudeau. And we've seen this uh, line of thinking uh, so much in Canadian politics. So uh, what, what, what's happening with the PPC? Where are they in the polls last time you checked? And, and uh, what do you suspect uh, will happen? Will they win any seats? Will they be the big spoiler? What, what, what's gonna happen there? I think they're more likely to be the big spoiler than win any seats. Uh, they're they're doing, uh, you know, for, for you know, they 1.6% of the vote last time. They're going to do considerably better than that. Uh, I think uh, it, they can certainly will top 4% nationwide, probably five. Uh, and in English Canada, that number is going to be higher. Uh, and there are certain parts of, of rural, uh, uh, southwestern, central Ontario, where I think we can see the PPC do a very significant, uh, uh, significant results. And in Alberta uh, as well, um, you know, a lot of the anger uh, about uh, Jason Kenney's handling of the uh, of the pandemic, uh, I think, uh, for people who don't want uh, more lockdowns or, or, or vaccine mandates or, or vaccine passports, uh, is going to uh, appear as a PPC vote uh, today. Uh, the other thing that's that's interesting is that the PPC. Uh, there seems to be this attitude that I, I keep running into people saying, well, the PPC voters, they're all going to go back to the Tories at the last minute, or they're all going to, they're not going to bother voting. They're the sort of people who don't vote that much, which I think is, is wishful thinking on behalf of, of uh, conservative activists. Um, it, it's not strong and, and advanced poll data is not, uh, not a particularly strong way of predicting uh, what's going on, but there are some indications in advanced poll data that the PPC has gotten a, a good chunk of vote in the advanced polls. That we've seen surges in advanced polls 
in areas that we expect the PPC to do well. So I think the PPC is going to do reasonably well, and I think they're going to cost the Conservatives a bunch of seats. To put it in context, when the PPC was at 1.6% last time, it cost the Conservatives, depending how you, you added it up, five, probably six seats in the last election. So if they're at three times that, if they're at five point something percent, I don't know if it'll cost Conservatives three times as many seats, but if 1.6 costs them six seats, 5% is going to cost them more than that. Interesting. Well, one of the things that I, I wonder about is, you know, if, if the support is strongest, say, in, in parts of southern Alberta or Alberta, uh, will that translate into a seat? Will they, will they pull out a seat in Alberta? And otherwise, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but there's not really an opportunity for vote splitting in some of those ridings because they're so staunchly conservative that the conservatives could go from getting 80% of the vote, or I don't know if they got 80, get 70% of the vote down to 40% of the vote and it wouldn't make a difference. You'd still elect a, a, a Tory MP. So uh, it, it, would it really make a difference or what, what parts of the country um, might a PPC uh, voter play spoiler? And then also uh, another question, Hamish, is some of the criticism of the PPC is that they lack the sort of machine, uh, political machine that many of the big parties have. And part of that political machine is just the get out the vote, the go TV strategy on election day, um, having volunteers, driving people to polling stations, making sure that everyone uh, knows that today is election day and that they have to get to the poll. Uh, the, 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 the idea or the thought out there is that the PPC just doesn't have that kind of infrastructure. They don't have that kind of um, political organization and that could hurt them today. So is that the case? Well, I think your first point, you're right. I don't think the PPC is going to win any seats in rural Alberta. And I don't think there's any seats in rural Alberta or rural Saskatchewan where the, the other parties are close enough to the Conservatives that the PPC can cost them those seats. I would say, though, is that if the PPC are doing well in rural Alberta, that, means, that doesn't mean they're not going to get any votes in Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, and there are seats like Calgary Skyview or Edmonton Centre uh, or Edmonton Griesbach where, uh, you know, shaving off three, four, five percent of the conservative, you know, they might, the PC might get 10 or 12 percent in some rural Alberta, but they get five or six percent in Edmonton, that could cost the conservatives um, some seats in that city, for instance, or maybe a, a Calgary Centre or a Calgary Skyview as well. Uh, and in Ontario, I think, I, I, I just don't think we can rule out the, the PPC's strength, particularly in rural uh, Ontario and southwestern Ontario. So there's a seat like Essex, you know, Essex is a tight uh, conservative NDP uh, switching seat. The Conservatives won it off the NDP last time. The NDP is obviously doing better uh, and coming hard. If PPC take three, four percent of the conservative vote there. Uh, we can expect the NDP to win that seat. You know, there's seats like uh, um, Derek Sloan's old seat, where uh, you know the, he, Derek's only won it over the Liberals by you know, three, three and a half percent last time. Um, the PPC uh, number, PPC is getting a, a good number of votes there. It means the Liberals will almost certainly win that seat on the split. Uh, and it also means it's harder for the Conservatives to pick up some seats that they're going to, that they're trying to do uh, in rural and ex-urban Ontario. So I think it puts a cap uh, on, on the ability of the Conservatives to grow in Ontario as well. Um, in terms of the PPC's organization, it's true. They certainly don't have the organization that the traditional uh, large parties have. Um, and that organization certainly makes a difference in very close elections. You know, if you're down to five or 600 votes between your parties, uh, having a great, uh, a great organization makes a huge difference. If you're winning by 5,000 votes or losing by 5,000 votes, having a huge volunteer get out the vote team is, is helpful, but it's not going to make the difference. So I don't think the PPC, you know, look, if the PPC end up losing a seat by a couple hundred votes, it's absolutely can be taken down to, uh, to, to lack of organization. But I don't, I don't see anything with the possible exception of Bernier's seat where the PPC has actually got a chance to win a seat. Um, everything I've such seeing is that they are, uh, their vote is, they don't have, with one or two exceptions, they don't really have star candidates. They don't have, you know, it'd be different if it was, you know, in some community, the, guy, the, the person who'd been warden of the county for 10 years was deciding to run for the PPC and have good name recognition, and there were some local motivating issues that they could build on top of the PPC's other issue set. 
there, uh, nobody I know can point can name a single PPC candidate besides Maxime Bernier. Um, and and they really don't have any sort of local heroes like that. In fact, in the last election, they were in better position because they had some former conservative MPs and former conservative candidates who were running for them. They don't seem to have that this time. And I think uh, that makes it harder for them to, to outperform in certain areas where a good organization could make the difference. Interesting. Yeah. Um, well, it, I, I guess we'll have to wait and see. I, I know a couple of the candidates, but that's mostly just from our own TNC coverage. Um, and yeah, it, it should be interesting. Well, Hamish, uh, you're going to be joining us for a live show tonight. I, I just one final question. What what are you going to be looking out for? What are the big indicators? I know you did the 45 ridings to watch for True North and, and you've done sort of in-depth analysis, but what are, are, are there any sort of major trends or are there any specific ridings that you're looking at that when the polls close and the, those uh, votes come in, that that will be the sort of like turning point in terms of who's going to win this thing? Yeah, so I think, I think there's two there's two different stages. You know, Atlantic Canada closes um, much earlier in the night, uh, and then uh, everywhere from Quebec to uh, Alberta closes at the same time uh, at 9:30 Eastern. Um, so those Atlantic Canada results, we're going to have them for an hour or something before the, uh, the the rest of the country comes in, exception of BC. Uh, and so in Atlantic Canada. Uh, the O'Toole people have um, some great hopes in um, uh, in, uh, in Nova Scotia in particular. I expect the Conservatives to do reasonably well in, in New Brunswick, but Nova Scotia is going to be very, very interesting. If the, if, if the Conservatives do well in Nova Scotia, pick up two or three seats, I think we can expect that they're going to overperform uh, nationally. Uh, so that's the first sort of thing I'm going to look at. Uh, and then following that, once we get into uh, Said you know the chunk of the chunk of Canada that stretches from the Rockies uh, to uh, the, the Bay de Chaleur. Uh, I think we're I'm looking at a couple of seats whether to block Liberal switcher seats to see if the block is going to go up if that 35 percent in the projection is is right for the block or if they're likely to to to, to end up around where they were last time or you maybe even lose a seat to Liberals. If the Liberals are winning some of the seats there, it could really pads them for losses elsewhere uh, in Ontario. I'm looking at us when we look at a seat like a Whitby to see if the Conservatives can break through in those sort of pure play suburbia 905 seats. Uh, and then uh, looking for the PPC in the Southwest and, and in the Western uh, parts of the country as well. Great. Well, it's going to be a really exciting night. Regardless, we're excited to have you part of the team. You're going to be breaking down the results as they come in and manning the uh, decision desk. So you'll be doing the big calls for us. We're really excited. We're going to be live in a few hours starting at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. So make sure you come back to YouTube or Facebook and watch that. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and uh, continue uh, finding our content here at True North. Hamish, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you again shortly. My pleasure. It's going to be a great night. All right. Thank you so much. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show.